The Riemann hypothesis may be the greatest unsolved math problem of all time, but it is only a small part of a much bigger story. And this story is the quest for a new geometry underlying the theory of L functions. In the R-Age saga, we will explain what L functions are, explain the dream of this new geometry that some people call geometry over the field with one element, or F1. We'll explain the connection to the Riemann hypothesis and other immortal problems like the BSD conjecture and the Langlands program. This will be a long journey. The starting point is the theory of L functions, where the simplest example is the Riemann zeta function. The dream is to find this unknown, hidden, elusive F1 geometry. The hope is then that this geometry could open up a path to a proof of the Riemann hypothesis. Today, I want to show you an article of Manin as an introduction to F1, then give a quick recap of the Riemann hypothesis, and finally say something about how you or I could start the search for a proof. But before we dive into that, let me just say that if you feel in season one that you love this kind of math, it's so beautiful, but there are too many words you don't understand, there are too many technical things, and you just feel a bit lost, then do not freak out. This is how it's supposed to be. I promise that starting next season, season two, I will do my very best to define everything carefully and explain things properly. The point of season one is only to build this global overview, which will help us together later to connect the many different aspects of this enormously large concept space that we're trying to make sense of. Everything we do in the r -Edge saga is built on conversations between myself and a very good friend whom you will meet in due time. And for the two of us, the dream is really to find this new geometry and maybe even prove the Riemann hypothesis. But what really matters is not the end goal, but the journey. I hope you'll join us for this voyage into the most mysterious and beautiful parts of the mathematical landscape. For a first encounter with F1, I just want to show you this article of Yuri Manin. Manin is a legend. Sadly, he passed away recently. He was one of very few mathematicians in the world who possessed something like an overview of all of mathematics. In this article, I just want to point out a few key ideas that we will encounter later and convey to you that when I say everything is connected, I'm not making things up. And you can read this article yourself later. It's openly available on the archive. The title here is Numbers as Functions. And the idea is that in order to solve the deepest problems of number theory, we may have to reimagine the very core of mathematics itself. In particular, we may have to rethink what we mean by the word number. Manin discusses a specific way of doing this, following a theory developed by Alexandru Buyum. Here in the abstract, uh, you see this phrase, geometry over fields with one element. He also mentions the very unexpected idea that there may be deep connections between prime numbers and physics. The P here is a prime number. 
The entire article is a story making unexpected connections between many different ideas. Let's just skim through the article together, and I will highlight some of the ideas that later will become clues for us in the sort of detective story of pursuing F1 geometry. To begin with, here is perhaps the most famous of all math formulas, e to the pi i equals minus 1. He also mentions the special value of the Riemann zeta function, pi squared over 6, which you may have seen in connection with the Basel problem. The discussion here in the beginning focuses on a certain class of numbers, which pop up in quantum field theory for mysterious reasons. Uh, these numbers are called periods. On page 3, we encounter this super important idea, which is uh, roots of unity. And then early on page 4, he mentions this hope that we have of approaching uh, the Riemann hypothesis. Some interesting examples of periods are algebraic numbers, so zeros of, of polynomial equations. Uh, the number pi is a period. And then these strange numbers you get by applying the gamma function to a rational number. So we could call them fractional gamma values. So everything here is super interesting. The uh, last few things I want to mention are these uh, Feynman integrals, or Feynman path integrals, connected to amplitudes in quantum field theory. And on page uh, 14, these notions called Grothendieck rings and Witt rings. And they are examples of algebraic structures with something called lambda operations. On page 16, we see something called FQ, which is a finite field. We'll come back to that. And this symbol F1, which is at the heart of this mysterious geometry. Finally, on page 18, he uses this phrase, the unfathomable abyss. And I really like this phrase because it conveys something of the depth you feel that you encounter in this space of ideas. Okay, let's do a quick recap of the Riemann hypothesis. The prime numbers are the numbers 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, and so on. If you write down the divisors of each positive integer, you'll see the prime numbers uh, as the numbers with exactly two divisors.
Let's look at some larger primes. For example, here are the primes just above 100. It's 101, 103, 107, and 109. Then it's 113, and then it's 127. Followed by 131, 137, I think, and 139 and 149. If you look at the jumps from one prime to the next, they seem to be rather random. Sometimes two primes are immediate neighbors, twin primes, like 101 and 103. But then sometimes there are huge gaps, like between 113 and 127. Is there an underlying structure here? Can we, in general, predict or understand when the next prime appears? This is where the Riemann zeta function enters the story. The prime numbers are connected to the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. The zeta function is a function from complex numbers to complex numbers. This means that for any complex number you give as input, you get a complex number as output. For example, input 2 gives output pi square over 6. Input minus 1 gives output minus 1 over 12. And input minus 2 gives output 0. So the number minus 2 is a 0 of the Riemann zeta function. If you look at all these zeros as points in the complex plane, some are quite easy to compute. They are minus 2, minus 4, minus 6, and so on, the negative even numbers. These are called the trivial zeros. The other zeros, called non-trivial, are all contained in the so-called critical strip. Meaning that the real part is between 0 and 1. The Riemann hypothesis states that the non trivial zeros all have a real part exactly equal to 1 half. In other words, that they lie on the so called critical line. Mathematicians have computed the first 12 trillion of these non trivial zeros and checked that they at least lie exactly on the critical line. So, their real part is one half. What about the imaginary parts? Well, you can compute them, and for the first few zeros, the imaginary parts are around 14.1, around 21, around 25. This sequence of numbers is called the Riemann spectrum. And we can compute a longer list of these values using SAGE. You could install SAGE on your own computer, but if you want to get started real quick, just go to sagecell.sagemath.org and type the following code. This code just prints the first 10 elements of the Riemann spectrum. But Using Sage, you can get any number up to around 2 million. To get a first idea of why these zeros are so interesting, let's look at the function f of x equals minus cosine of 14.1 times log x. This is a cosine wave with 14.1 as the angular frequency and log x as the variable. And log here is the natural logarithm, which you may have seen as ln. Let's plot the graph of f from x equals 1 to 15. This looks like some wave where the wavelength increases with x. But look at the peaks. It's not perfect, but there are peaks close to 1, close to 2, 3, 5, and slightly above 7. And there is one last peak here between 11 and 12. 
let's now add one more term to the definition of f. So now f of x is co minus cosine of 14.1 log x minus cosine of 21 log x. This function has peaks, let's see, it's roughly at 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, and then slightly above 12. Now we keep going with more and more terms, using the numbers from the Riemann spectrum to build these cosine waves. You can do this yourself in SageMath. With 10 terms, there are very clear peaks at, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and 13. But we also see the beginning of some smaller peaks. We can do any number of terms here. Let's use uh, 100 terms. Let's extend this graph all the way up to x equals 20. Now, maybe you can guess what the smaller peaks are. Following 2, there are peaks at 4, 8, and 16. Following 3, there is a peak at 9, and there would be more peaks at 27, 81, and so on. These are the powers of 2 and the powers of 3. In general, as we add more and more terms, and as we extend the range of x values, there will be spikes at all prime powers. And a prime power is just a prime number raised to some positive exponent. These graphs are a first tiny hint that, although we usually focus on the primes, the prime powers will also be super important to us. And if you want to look at these graphs, maybe with a different number of terms or different range of x values, here is the code that we used on the SageCell website to generate these plots. Just change the number 10 and the number uh, 15, if you want. Just recall that these graphs, all these spikes, came not from knowing the prime numbers, they came only from the Riemann spectrum. So clearly, there is some kind of connection here between the Riemann spectrum and the prime numbers. And this is just insane. The prime numbers shouldn't have anything to do with cosine waves. If you dive more into the details of this connection, which we're not doing today, and you want to understand how many primes there are up to a given number, like up to 20 or up to 1 million, then the key thing turns out to be how far from the critical line a zero can occur. And the most perfect and beautiful situation would be if all the zeros were actually exactly on the line. And this conjecture is the Riemann hypothesis. Now, how could we prove the Riemann hypothesis. This is, of course, the million dollar question. There are many books about the Riemann zeta function and lots of books about the Riemann hypothesis. In some of these, you'll find lists of lots of things that people have tried and lots of ideas that might possibly play a role in some future proof. Of course, no one really has any idea as to what will eventually work. But I think one of the best places, maybe the best place, if you want to read about these ideas, is a quite recent article of Brian Connery. So Connery is one of the world's leading experts on the Riemann hypothesis. He has lots and lots of super interesting uh, research papers, but for the average person on the street, probably the most famous paper is the one where he proved that at least 40% of the zeros in the critical strip are actually on the critical line. You can read this paper 
yourself or skim read it. I just want to highlight a few of the ideas that I think are most interesting. There is a discussion in the beginning of the history behind the problem and the connection between the primes and the zeros. There is a short section on why do we think RH is true. That is also super interesting. Then you have this spectral interpretation idea, meaning that the zeros may be eigenvalues of some operator. Some initial thoughts about proving RH. That sounds uh, interesting. Then I want to highlight this number 16, Vale's explicit formula and positivity criterion. 17 is Lee's criterion. And then you have the analogy with function field zeta functions. Also, look at the notion of the Selberg class. That's an attempt to write down axioms for what an L function is. This idea of a family of L function is important. And again, the word positivity appears. Positivity is really a key stepping stone, I think, to any future proof of RH. Finally, the last section, or second to last, random matrix theory. That is a super interesting field of research. OK, check out the paper. To summarize, maybe the three most important ideas here is, number one, we should study all L functions, not just the Riemann zeta function. And that is because there are patterns and phenomena which are not visible if you study the Riemann zeta function only. Number two, focus on this notion of positivity. This is one of few general approaches to the Riemann hypothesis, which works for L functions in general and not just the Riemann zeta. Number three, revisit the analogy with function fields. The analogy with function fields zeta functions, where the Riemann hypothesis is already proven, is one of the main reasons that we believe the Riemann hypothesis is true. It's also one of the main sources for new ideas for a hidden F1 geometry. In the next episode, we'll start looking at sources of L functions. L functions come from something we call primal objects. And we'll also begin looking at another one of the great problems, namely the Langlands program.